Hi everyone and welcome to this week's The Cauldron. Tonight we have got a special guest, Susan Smith from Four Women Scotland. So Susan, tonight we were going to interview you and ask you a couple of questions of why. So can you start off by telling us why you started Four Women Scotland? Well, I wasn't actually one of the four people who started it. So that was Mary and Trina, Magdalene and Nicole. And it was immediately after the first GRA um, consultation, which was really early in Scotland. It was before things kind of kicked off a bit more in England. So people got an idea of what was happening around this. And it really passed under the radar. And so um, women in Scotland were really, really worried that this was just going to be passed into law without anybody really noticing what was going on. So um, they'd got together in a room, the four of them, and decided they were going to fight on. And they then put out a call to other people in Scotland who'd been involved and who were keen to get going on things. And um, I was one of them. And I was... Um, I was a little bit, yeah, in the early days, I don't think we really knew what we were doing or how we were going to do it or where we were going to start. Um, and I I think I just started volunteering to do stuff. So suddenly I ended up with a load of responsibilities and um, it kicked off from there. But it was, it was really hard because we didn't know we'd had very little um, traction in that first um, consultation. So it was just trying to grind the message out, see more people, do as much as we could, write letters. And those days we were, you know, if you got a letter in the Scotsman, that was the height of our achievements. So it's, we've really come a long, long way since then. Um, but yeah, so it, we, we started with GRA and we've moved on to all sorts of other things as well, although the GRA is still a huge priority for us. I think when I first found out about uh, what was going on in Scotland, it, it was mostly, it was Joan McAlpine who was talking about the census and saying, you know, they weren't going to be a, a sex question on the census, it was going to be gender. And so I immediately thought, hold on a minute, if you're not recording people's sex, how are you going to do things like um, pay women in boardrooms, women's pay, but also things for the Equality Act, because children, women get special provisions under the Equality Act, because women do the majority of childcare, for example. So that means yeah. that if you disadvantage an employee because of childcare, you could be potentially in breach of, of the sex. You, it could potentially be sex discrimination. I think it is sex discrimination because yes. women predominantly do the childcare. So now if men can say they're women, all these categories would be glossed over. There wouldn't be any real categories anymore and, you know, to know whether women were getting treated fairly or not. So this is how I came into it. But I have to say, I never in my wildest dreams at that point imagined the true horror of the whole thing. I still believe that uh, when they talked of trans, they meant men that had a completely changed their body. They had no male parts. <laughs> I didn't realize about the trans umbrella. So I didn't realize that they didn't like the word mother and they decided female was a transphobic dog whistle. I could never imagine the, the depths of where we are, uh, Susan. So what's been your favourite campaign to run? Oh gosh, well there's quite a few, but actually to go back to that thing about the census, because that was that was really our first, you know, we started on the GRA, but the census was really the first thing that picked up, and it was because Joan was really interested and was asking the questions, and, and she got it. Um, so we'd put in a consultation as had Fair Play for Women, Women's Place UK. And we were invited, I think, I think, I think probably some of the bigger UK groups like Fair Play or Women's Place UK were invited, I'm not sure. But we were the people who were able to go. And um so that was that was a bit of a baptism of fire for me because I was launched into sitting in front of that committee, who fortunately were all pretty 
good and got the issues and were reasonably sympathetic and very professional. So that was that was the first thing we really tackled. And and that did start things rolling once we got onto that census thing. But that was absolutely, absolutely terrifying. That was, I I'd volunteered to do that and I was sitting in that meeting thinking why did I volunteer to do this but it was it we had to do it I just felt we had to do it and I agree with you that when I started and you know it was a real baptism of fire because when I started looking at it I agree I, I agree I just thought we were talking about transsexuals I was um very very liberal myself and liberal politically and I um I I never assumed that I think that I would have ended up on this side it was just that I started to look at the the arguments and what people were talking about and instinctively I knew that it was wrong as a feminist I knew it was wrong um as a classic liberal feminist rather than a new version liberal feminist and um so that was so the census was important I think in terms of in terms of campaigns that have been really important and actually fairly and, and successful but also felt really worthwhile and important to do um getting involved in the six words campaign was was really crucial and um I could not believe that the government was sitting there arguing about um, not specifying sex in that in that bill. It was just one of, and that's when I I lost a, a lot of faith in certain MSPs, and I gained a huge amount of respect for other <laughs> MSPs um, because the people who were prepared to, I think abandon their principles and say no this is this is fine we're happy with this um i'm thinking especially of msps who sat on that committee and agreed that it should be sex and then went into the chamber and argued that it shouldn't i i um i think there's one in particular but i i, I cannot imagine why anybody how anybody could do that and it was the to give the survivors of rape and sexual assault the right to request a female examiner. And they had put that to the committee. And the committee, I think, had agreed, but then the government backed out and said they were going to they they weren't going to do it. And Joanne Lamont put in an amendment, which you um <laughs> which the government were not going to accept until you did your campaign, which was a very, if it hadn't been for your campaign, then that would not have passed. The, the amendment would not have passed. The only reason it passed was your campaign because the MSPs got scared, I think. I think as well, it showed the power of um, popular opinion and the power of, writing writing to your MSP and at the moment we're trying to get people to write about the GRA we've got a campaign that's just started you might have seen a few of our ads on Twitter and Facebook and we've got the first two out we've got one about um, girls who've been referred to the NHS in England for surgery and we've also got one about uh, women's prisons and um we really are urging people just to click and send an email to MSPs. And then I would say if they get back, which they are, and some of them are just sending a standardized letter back, to to get back onto them because um I think they think they can brush people off. And it's what the what the six words campaign showed really clearly is that if enough people get on board and keep coming back at them and saying no 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 this is this is what you don't understand they're talking in this about misinformation much as they were doing in that um campaign initially and i think if people can keep coming back and say no i am not misinformed i know exactly where this leads and i have the evidence to back it up then hopefully there will be enough people who start to realise that this is not something that is widely supported in Scotland and 
Yeah. Maybe it's a long shot, but maybe we can do it. Yeah, I seen a poll with the, that James Kelly's been running, and it does show clearly that the Scottish public is on the side of us <laughs> and not the side of gender fanatics. Um, and they've, they've been clearly against having males in women's sports and ha and clearly against allowing males in changing rooms. And uh, so his res and and clearly clearly against self ID and the percentages are around about seventy five twenty five. So if we can, we can because he's doing he's doing very fair questions. He's had to do them very fair. Who's this nineteen yep. percent that want male in women's sports? So you get people responding, uh, but actually his, his question is very bland because it's been done for blandness. But it does show that we could if we can get the right messages we can convince people will be on our side so we can win so in on the prisons thing i know that there's ma males in prison in scotland already it, we've heard from people women that have been in court and bail that there are males in court and bail so lisa um, you've been doing a little bit of research into males and women's prisons <laughs> so. um before i go on to that though i'm just gonna add here i'm gonna pop a link in the description for four women's campaigns that they're running just now so everybody who's watching could you please do these campaigns they are so important um as for women's prisons i've been looking at women's prisons in canada um today and i've, I've taken some notes actually because there's quite a lot to remember but there was a four-month survey um heather mason an advocate for women in prison uh, sent surveys to the incarcerated women about being locked up with male prisoners. Um, there were 60 women responded to it, and a majority of them said that they felt unsafe. There were specific incidents that had been mentioned. So to go on to the percentages, obviously this is of 60 women. So 12% of the 60 women said that they, they had good experiences. It wasn't negative, it wasn't positive. It was just, you know, no experience more. So 65 had bad experiences and 23% just never really got involved, so they again didn't have an experience. But 70% of all the women that were um, surveyed said that they felt unsafe. Majority of the women said that re they had reported at least two negative types of behaviours, so 4 in 10 had been sexually harassed um, in the whole of the prison. A third of them had been threatened or physically assaulted by biological male prisoners. Um, 51, no, sorry, 52% said that there was strange or weird behaviour, 43% said that they were sexually harassed, 32% were th threatened and physically assaulted, and then 8% were sexually assaulted. Now, I know 8% doesn't sound like a lot, but even one prisoner being sexually assaulted or being made to feel uncomfortable, that is too many. Um, the women have reported having to change their, their routines and their habits. Um, they said that their safety and their security in the facility had been impacted. They experienced deterioration of mental health. 87% of the women have had direct negative impact of, of the men using their facilities. There was actually one woman who had said, where was it now? It was horrific actually. She had a man threatened to stab her in the neck with a knife. He tried to sexually assault her, he stole from her, he physically assaulted her when they got into an argument, and he has done this to other women. Um, another male prisoner, now this is actually a testimony from one of these Canadian ladies, she said, a male prisoner who admittedly brags to friends about playing the system, pretended to be a woman, targeting me, along with continuous, countless others, in an attempt to have sexual relations. Now he was bragging about this. Simple things we are no longer able to do, like walking into the bedroom from the shower in a towel. You just feel more self-conscious. You overthink your movements, like putting down your curtain when you're getting changed. Sometimes their clothing is very uncomfortable to be around, like a bra with the jacket undone. So these people, these, these men that are in women's prisons, they are deliberately going out their way to make these poor vulnerable women with no escape, they're going out their way to make them feel scared and to make them feel uncomfortable because they're getting weird kicks off it. And actually there was a, I, I will put the link for the, the page here. There were countless testimonies from these women. Women had been raped. Women were saying that these men were getting off on making them feel uncomfortable. They were saying that they deliberately went to women's prisons so that they could still have sex. Um, so I was looking into it 
and it, it just horrified me. So in Scotland now, um, the government agency is set to review the practice granting requests by male inmates to women's prisons because um, this this is there's been pressure being getting put on the Scottish prisons since 2018 in December. And I think that has been a direct effect of Karen White because obviously Karen White, a father of two, went into women's prisons and raped women. And he admitted that. So something's got to be done because... As much as Canada is horrific, that's exactly where Scotland is going. Yeah, and I noticed the government saying that they are going to start a consultation with women prisoners after, like, they've already let males into the prison. They're going to maybe ask women prisoners uh, what impact it has, an equality's impact. Uh, so, yeah, as usual, the government just really doesn't care about women at all, not in the slightest. I noticed in um, the COP, 26, um, Nicholas Sturgeon complaining and saying not enough women were part of the tech, te you know, the solution to climate change. Well, you know, it's, it's very simple. Just have the men identify as women. And that's the problem solved for Nicola Sturgeon, because she believes that a man who says he's a woman has suffered the same oppression as a woman and should be treated exactly the same as if he is a woman. And he has redefined women in law to that effect. <laughs> but I know you can't talk too much about it, Susan, but I believe you are currently in court over this very issue. Um, yeah, we had we were back in court last week for um, the appeal on the judicial review that we brought um, earlier in the year, and um, so yeah, that's that's about the Gender Representation on Public Boards Act and um, the the definition of women in there, which involves uh, people who are men who have self basically self identified as women. It's, it said that they have the protected characteristic of gender reassignment, but there's there's no real definition for what that is. So they've been included in it, but women who might not define themselves as women have been excluded. So um, our appeal has said it is at once too broad and too too exclusive because it also trans men under this bill they are not counted as women. No, that's right. They, um, yes, or or even I think uh, if you're non-binary, so if you're you just put non-binary, you you don't, and of course that has no definition in law anyway. So it it seems a little bit vague, but um, hopefully hopefully the judges will be able to pick a way through it. Trans women who have a GRE they will have the protection of gender reassignment, but also the protection of sex. So it's starting to get double <laughs> protection, which seems a rather a little bit unfair because they haven't had the oppression of sex and why they would need the, the um, protection of it when they already have the protection of gender reassignment. That goes back to why um, the GRA reform does matter. I mean, all these people who, um, MSPs who, we know people have had replies from saying there will be no impact. Well, there will, because if people can legally change their sex, this isn't about them legally changing gender because gender is not defined. This is about them legally changing sex. So they can then claim under sex discrimination measures, which are supposed to apply to the opposite sex. And so then sex really does become meaningless. And um, and once it's become all of, of a mush, as we've seen with the census, they start to say, well, it doesn't matter. You just put what you want. And you can't put what you want for anything else. Um, I think I think that um, going back slightly to um, Lisa's um, dreadful survey, I mean, it's, it's awful what's been happening in Canada. Um, I think, again, that's another good example to go back to MSPs with and say this is when you say there's no issues with self-ID in other countries, here is a perfect example of an issue with self-ID. And there is nothing, once somebody has legally changed their sex, um, 
prison experts say they cannot keep that person out of a woman's prison. They can't. It doesn't matter that all this nonsense about we will risk assess them. No, they can't be legally kept out of a woman's prison at that point. So it's if you have no gatekeeping, you have nothing to stop these these violent prisoners um, playing it, and they will play it. They've already played it, as you say, in Scotland without the GRA, with um, the access to the self ID GRA. They've just used the self ID principle that um, the prison service introduced without any consultation with women. And that review has been years coming. They've been talking about doing a review and talking to women prisoners for years and nothing has happened. Where do you think England is compared to Scotland? Where are, are, are we quite behind bringing biology back, so to speak? <laughs> yes. Um, and I don't... Politically, I think that... Um, the Conservatives in Westminster have realised that this is not something that is supported or popular. And I think instinctively, a lot of them don't support it. I think instinctively, a lot of the Labour MPs don't support it. Um, but they they were trotting along with it. Um, so I think once the wind had kind of gone out of the sails and once all the stonewall stuff started to blow up, I don't think there's a lot of will to push this. I would imagine to an extent that probably might be true as well in Scotland, but I think unfortunately there seems to be at the top of our government, there is a real desire for this. And also I think Scotland institutions have been really thoroughly captured, probably more than in England because I don't know whether it's because of all the funded organisations who've been feeding back in this sort of endless loop that we've had going on, that they were funded and they were funded on the basis that they had to promote this line and then they promoted that line back to the government. But um, what the Nolan podcast shows, how deep this goes within our civil service. And it goes deep within other organisations like the police and the court. And the more centralised everything is and the more tight and the more people in, in, in Civic Scotland are interconnected. I think the, the more that feeds back off each other. So, um, but yeah, the more people get to hear about it, hopefully, because as you say, most people do not agree with it. I, I don't know many people, normal people, who, who have much truck with it. With yourself, Lisa. You had a baptism of fire because you had no idea of what you were allowed and not allowed to say. And I think this happens to quite a lot of people because I can remember being incredibly shocked when I first started seeing on social media, hold on, wait a minute, and getting like complete pylons from the gender queer folk and the um, uh, and, you know, SMP politicians and things. And I was like, hold on a minute. I've only said something that I thought was quite a natural thing to say. And suddenly I'm like this complete baddie. So you had the same experience, didn't you, Lisa? Just saying like straightforward things and being surprised at the reaction. Well, yeah, I didn't even have social media when that happened to me. So like literally sitting in a lecture um, called Gender, Feminism and the Law. So I thought, right, it's, it's going to be a class about like, women's rights it's going to be really easy I'll pass this no problem and then all of a sudden I'm getting asked to define a woman and I'm like well women's someone with a vagina and the ability to reproduce and they're all like jumping at me like oh you're so transphobic you can't say that you're denying existence of people and and I was like I honestly I'm like what are these people talking about so because it was a team's chat I literally and I've said this a million times but I literally typed to them what the definition of a woman was because I thought right if they see it in black and white they literally can't argue with it <laughs> obviously I was making things worse for myself but never in a million years did I ever think the definition of a woman would get me called transphobic or a bigot or anything like that that's just it's so outrageous but this is kind of what people are being told to think now and I don't believe for a second 
anybody believes this nonsense because that is exactly what it is. It's nonsense. Um, women have vaginas, men have penises. That's the way it has been since the dawn of time. Um, nobody actually believes the nonsense that this isn't true. Nobody. But it's all this virtue signaling. Oh, we have to take offence for people that are not here, but we must be offended for them. And that's what it boils down to. <laughs> Yeah, and the ridiculous things like, have you seen the latest of the um, transgender crossings, road crossings? Oh my God. Like, people, guide dogs can't operate those roads. They're not safe. They don't understand it. The um, horses can't understand them. There's people with all sorts of visual impairments and also, um, you know, certain types of epilepsy and things like that, that the crossings are hard. And nobody risk assessed this. Every, they just thought, let's virtue signal. We're going to paint wildly coloured crossings. Won't it be great? And, and we'll look fabulous. Without thinking like, you know, you've pre- painted a crossing for transgender inclusivity for people that don't need it and you're disadvantaging this whole group they need to safely cross the road I do wonder how many children will die at this because obviously children will see the colorful crossings and they're like oh I'm gonna go and run and play and they will shoot off and a car will be coming along and boom the the child is dead so I think there's going to be casualties on these crossings no doubt I, I think it's another example of how people have elevated this particular campaign above everything else. So when people talk about equality and diversity now, they're not talking about disability, they're not talking about race, they're not talking about sexuality even, because these are the harder things. And this, I think, I think this was why this started, that it seemed to be a bit of a oh oh this is this is a bit of a cheap cheap win and it's not been a cheap win as we know because it's affected women but it also seems to have eaten up all the equality pot um and and now and it's impacted women and now it's impacting the disabled um and the real the real issue probably in Scotland and in England is that this has been introduced into all sorts of things like schools and universities and it runs so deep so now people are getting stonewall out which is great but in Scotland we've got quite a lot of other organizations that are digging in there so if stonewall goes we've still got all the others and the training is still in there and there is so much training from all these different groups and it's going to take quite a lot to go through all of that stuff and say, where was your equality and impact assessment? And it, it's not there. It's not there on any of it. It wasn't there on the prisons, as you said, but it's not there on this stuff with the disabled. And um, I think schools and universities, especially because they're bringing through the next generation of people and they're going to go out and they're going to take this into the world. So it's really important we my worry with the girls at uni they were sitting there along with the lecturer saying that all men were rapists now these girls are going to go in to practice law these girls could be procurator fiscals they could be defense lawyers and they are not going to fight to get obviously the person they're representing off with rape if they go in with the mindset that all men are rapists now that's a really dangerous narrative to be taken forward and like you say these are the future politicians these are their future teachers these are our future you know, police, these these people are going to be in charge of the world. And that is scary if they are going out with this thought. And the thing that bothers me as well is poverty. So obviously, equality is not about poverty anymore. It's like nobody mm. cares. Being poor is the thing that most disadvantages anybody. In poverty is the biggest disadvantage that any any person can can have and of course some of the other disadvantages you know compound poverty like disabilities and you're more likely to be poor so we never tackle poverty we never care about um, advancing people that have come from poor backgrounds I mean how many campaigns do you see of ad- advancing people that have have come from an area of deprivation to become an MSP. How many MSPs do we have from areas of deprivation? How many counsellors do we have? Probably very few. 
you know so there's no there's nothing about tackling poverty and all the energy is put into <laughs> transgender that's it everybody else it's like this monster it first it ate up women then it ate up well, first it ate up lesbians, then it ate up women, then it ate up homosexual males. Now it's eating up the disabled. You know, it's going for everybody. This monster is taking all the money, all the resources, all the energy and from every other pre protected characteristic is all going into this to transgender. And um, poor people, well, nobody cares about them, you know. Not at all. And if you think about what transgender is, it's personality. You've got a sex and you've got a personality. Yes. Yeah. And and now sexuality has been redefined as your preferences, your dating preferences. So that's the other thing that, you know, do you like flowers on a first date? Right, you're now under the the rainbow. And and that's insulting as well, especially to people who really fought and were persecuted in the 70s, 80s, 60s, 70s, 80s, whatever. And they're now being told that somebody's LGBTQ plus because they happen to not want to go out with somebody. What is queer? I mean, nobody defines queer. And of course, it was a slur. And still very many homosexuals are still very offended by that word because it reminds them of when it was a slur. Um, and um, But what is queer? What does it mean? All these heterosexual people are coming out as queer because they have what? What is it? Is it because they have pink hair? What makes you queer? What is it? I saw something, um, and I, I, I've not, I, I didn't actually read it properly. So, um, but there was a report about young people in America now. There's some extraordinary number, like about thirty or forty percent, and now identifying as queer. And obviously, most of those are not homosexual. They are just people who are adopting this identity. And at some point, you know, it'll be what, 50%, 60%. And at that point, it'll no longer be trendy. And they'll all move on to the next thing. But it's, and youth movements have always existed, but I don't think they ever used to claim to be oppressed at the same time and demand society reshape itself. I, yeah, and they all, they, I don't think they ever had the government backing. <laughs> I don't see how you could be a, a, an oppressed, marginalised minority when every MP, MSP is falling over themselves to back you to the hilt. I know you're 16, right? You don't know it all. <laughs> and you're queer whatever that means. So yeah, they're certainly not an oppressed, marginalised minority with the amount of power they have. And uh, I don't think um, adults should take their laws from children. And that's what this government is doing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I think that's been a really good discussion with you tonight, Susan. I think on that note, we should probably close up. Um, do you guys have any last words? I saw a report that Stonewall had written to a nursery school. Now the children in the nursery school are two to four, you know, two year olds to four year olds. And they'd written to the nursery school and asked the nursery school if they had any transgender children. Like, wait a minute, these children are two to four. And what they really meant was, if you don't have any, we can make some for you. <laughs> Let us in. Yeah, that is exactly what they meant. What about you, Susan? Have you got any last words for tonight? Just to reinforce, please, please, please keep retweeting or posting our um, links to our campaigns when they come out on Facebook or sending them to you know elderly relatives who might be on email or or filling them in for your elderly relatives. And um I say if the MSPs get back to you and they get back to you with nonsense. Write back to them and tell them why they're wrong. 
Thank you. And thank you very much for joining us tonight, Susan. My final words tonight are, I am still suing Aberty University. Aberty have come out with the notion of intention to defend their action, which means we are definitely going to court and we need more money um, to fight this. So far, we've got £13,500. So if people could please keep donating and sharing and spread the word, I would really, really appreciate that. I'll put the link in the description on this video as well. And thank you, everyone, for watching tonight. Goodbye. Bye.